charge of your health in Dr. George Guthrie's Community Health Lecture Series. We're happy to see all of you here tonight. And um, for any of you who haven't been here before, I want um, to introduce Dr. Guthrie and, and let you know a little bit about his background. And I'm going to ask him to come up this time. <laughs> and um, help us get to know um, some of his uh, background and um, how he got interested in what he's doing and whatever he would like to tell us about himself. Dr. Guthrie is a uh, family physician, a medical doctor. I will tell you that he graduated from Loma Linda University, I believe, in 1981. You've got it. And uh, has had a very broad and extensive um, background and experience um, in lifestyle medicine. So, Dr. Guthrie, would you let us know um, something about yourself? Okay. I think we can uh, share a little, get the microphone adjusted here to about the right spot. I'm a family physician, uh, was very interested in lifestyle medicine because of my challenges, the challenges I had with weight when I was a child. Those of you that the last lecture heard something about that. And <clears throat> with that interest, after practicing for a little bit, I went back to Loma Linda University and did a Master's of Public Health in Nutrition. Was able to teach a little while. Uh, then I, my wife and I got involved with the CHIP program. Have you all heard about that? There's one going on downstairs right now. And uh, the California Highway Patrol? No, but it was a good try. <laughs> it's a coronary health improvement project, or program, sometimes they say it that way. That got me interested in the whole lifestyle change uh, from a different perspective, the group perspective. Then I spent some time at Lifestyle Center of America, about five years, most of the time I was the medical director. And then the opportunity came for me to join the family medicine residency here at Florida Hospital South where my job is to teach lifestyle medicine to the um, residents in, in uh, family medicine. <coughs> lifestyle medicine, have you heard that term before? Lifestyle medicine means what can you do in your lifestyle to make a difference in your health? So it's focusing on the patient's responsibility more than the doctor's responsibility. Lifestyle medicine turns the doctor into a coach and a teacher and an encourager rather than a dictator. Take this pill, get these lab tests, and I'll see you in three months, right? That's not enough when we're talking about lifestyle change. If you're going to lose weight, those pills are not going to do it. You have to change your lifestyle. And that's the best way to manage diabetes, heart disease, obesity, hypertension. Our lecture next time will be on hypertension, so we'll add that one to, to the uh, uh, spectrum. How was that? Before we get started tonight, uh, I'd like for us to, could we have a word of prayer? Sure. Uh, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the many blessings that come our way from your loving hand. Uh, we pray tonight that each person will come, that has come, will be blessed and that each one will find something here from Dr. Guthrie's teaching that will help them in optimizing their health. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. I have entitled our discussion tonight, You Light Up My Life. I think that is a little bit of a clue of the era that I grew up in. That was a hit song, I think, the year I graduated from high school. So it, it kind of has a nice ring in it uh, to me. Uh, people have asked me in the past, well, what is the most important thing that I can do for my health? And the answer has often been, especially when we're talking about a group of people, 
One of the most important things you can do is to check your vitamin D level and to make sure it's adequate. People who thought they had a healthy lifestyle got really sick because their vitamin D level wasn't where it belongs. Well, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And I think, well, I hope that by the time we're done, you will be knocking on your doctor's door and saying, I need my vitamin D level checked. Because it does so much more than we thought when we first kind of discovered it. The importance of vitamin D and sunshine to your health. Someone asked about the alphabet soup behind my name. This is my name, George Guthrie. MD stands for medical doctor. MPH is miles per hour. <laughs> Masters of public health. <coughs> CDE stands for certified diabetes educator. And CNS stands for certified nutrition specialist. Now the PowerPoint slides are going to be a bit complicated, but they're very well documented as far as the scientific literature is concerned. If you would like a copy of that, you can get the PowerPoint slides at www. It's at the very bottom of the of the slide here. I'm sorry. Dot ACLM. Uh, the screen's up there. I can't move it very easily. ACLM dash articles dot net. Oops, somebody's got a second dash over there, and it's supposed to be a dot. So, but you understand the dot net piece. So the whole, all, the whole PowerPoint slide is up there, and you can get it. You go to something that says lectures, and then find vitamin D. And it should say five, vitamin D 5-09. So you know it was the one for today. Is this five? Yeah, this is May. OK, let's get started. What is vitamin D? Well, uh, the first thing we need to learn is that vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's actually a hormone. When while we talk of it as a vitamin, we do so because of how it was discovered. It is actually a hormone, and we need to have an adequate amount of this hormone in our body. Vitamin D, the hormone vitamin D, is made from cholesterol. Well, it's close. It's called 7-dehydroxycholesterol. Cholesterol has these rings of carbons. There's four of them and then a little bit of a tail. Looks a bit like a mouse trying to go around a corner, if you don't mind. <coughs> Sunshine then hits that cholesterol in our skin and changes it. It changes it by breaking a little bond here. And you can see it, right? Right there. The sunlight energy breaks that bond and turns it into a pre-vitamin D. Now, the wavelength of energy that does that is 290 to 315 nanometers. Those are exactly the same wavelengths of sunlight that cause sunburn. So when the energy is taken up by the cholesterol, it is uh, absorbed, and the cholesterol is changed into vitamin D, and the radiation from the sun does not damage the protein or the DNA in the cells. It actually protects you against suntan, sunburn. It's protective. Now, you see down at the bottom of the uh, slide here two different forms. If this piece is broken right here, then this becomes a hinge. And it can keep in the, the same sort of structure, or it can turn downwards. There's the hinge kind of flipped over a little bit. So what, right? <clears throat> what do you know that vitamin D is good for? What did you hear about? Probably the same thing I heard in medical school. Strong bones helps you absorb calcium. We have discovered that there are other things that vitamin D does. This particular structure here helps with the calcium, the one that looks like cholesterol. But this other one that has kind of the one carbon ring flipped downward does some very interesting things. Let's talk a little bit about them. 
Here's the vitamin D. You see the skin, the sun hits it, and then uh, it's changed in the liver to something called 25-hydroxyvitamin D. Now, <clears throat> you uh, probably don't, well, at this point, you wouldn't know how important that is, but if you happen to have a piece of paper and a pen, what I'd like you to do is write down 25-hydroxyvitamin D because that's what you're going to need to ask your doctor to, to order to find out how much you have in your blood. Uh, a lot of doctors don't know much about it and you say I want a vitamin D level and they'll say maybe okay <clears throat> and then they'll order a vitamin D level and the nurse will come back to them and said which one of those vitamin D's did you want? Because there's two of them and you don't want the wrong one because it, we don't know what it means you do want the right one. So just ask him or her, your doctor, for 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D. So the liver changes it into 25-hydroxy, then the kidney changes it into the very active form, which is 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And that helps with the bones, strengthen the bones, put the calcium in the bones, and helps absorb calcium from the intestines. Let's see what happens next. <clears throat> there it goes. Now there are some other things that it does. You can see we have the calcium, muscle and bone health, even some blood pressure regulation. But there's another area here. Look at this one. Monocytes and macrophages are part of the immune system. Uh, <clears throat> these help to fight infection. When your immune system gets out of balance, you might have a disease called an autoimmune disease. Have you heard of those? Things like rheumatoid arthritis, or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or type 1 diabetes, or there's a variety of autoimmune diseases. And vitamin D works in that area and helps to balance the immune system. We'll talk more about that. Here's the third area that might be a surprise to you. This hormone that we call vitamin D not only helps with calcium, but it also, and, and the immune system, but it also tends to calm down cancer. Vitamin D is the strongest terminal differentiator that we know of. Don't look at me like that. That was supposed to be dramatic and you were supposed to say, wow, but your eyes kind of glazed over. Let me explain. Terminal differentiator, what does that mean? When you started out in your mama's tummy, you were one cell, then you went to two, and then you went to four, and then you went to eight and 16, and somewhere along the line, one of those cells was going to turn into your heart. And then it started to divide, one cell, two, four, and it got up to just the right size and then stopped growing. You didn't, it didn't want to get too big. That's called terminal differentiation. Now, that terminal differentiation needs to be adjusted because as that child comes out and starts to grow, the heart needs to grow a little bit too, but not too much because you don't want a heart that's too big. Terminal differentiation is, help, is what helps the cells know when to stop growing. Does it make sense? Now, let's drive it really home. Cancer is simply cells that have lost their terminal differentiation. Wow. Vitamin D may very well help prevent cancers, and I'll show you some evidence that that is the case. So vitamin D is a broad and important topic. Where do you get vitamin D? From the sunshine. How many of you <clears throat> have been to your dermatologist, and they said, oh, you got some, old, some spots, right? And uh, maybe they froze them, but what did they tell you about sunshine? Stay out of the sunshine. So we've got two kind of groups of doctors, right? One uh, group of doctors saying, stay out of the sunshine. It'll make you look old faster. It will um, t may give you skin cancer. And then there's another group of doctors which are saying, now, wait a minute, you need to have enough vitamin D. You need to be out in the sun. Now, we're in Florida, and I would expect that uh, a lot of people get a lot of sun. But the doctors have been very effective at this. And they are, uh, the dermatologist telling people to stay out, and it's surprising how many people are actually uh, deficient. I have a dermatologist friend who is so afraid of the sun, he moved to Michigan. 
And I saw him in Texas at a meeting about four years ago. And uh, <clears throat> the sun was shining. Uh, he had this huge wide rim hat, and he kind of stood under it like this. And I asked him, I said, have you heard anything about vitamin D? Yeah, he says, I'm sure it's good. <laughs> but he didn't want to get his sun in the skin. Well, I understand that, and it's, there's a balance. Certainly you don't want sunburn, but the, vitamin, the creation of vitamin D is actually protecting your skin from the damage of the sun. It's when you overwhelm that, and we'll talk a little more about that as we go on. Three important functions for vitamin D. This is a summary slide and probably just a little too much to go over today. Uh, <clears throat> what happens with vitamin D in the bones? Well, it tends to increase the calcium absorption, help with phosphorus, and helps to uh, build bones uh, quite a bit stronger. Here's a picture to cover some of those other uh, things that we talked about. Here is the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. I think the next one will actually tell us. Yes, there it is. There it comes. That's the one to write down. 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's in the blood. Uh, it goes to the parathyroid glands and helps with uh, uh, that, that particular part of the calcium. It, uh, Look at here, down at the bottom. It helps the pancreas make insulin. You all heard about diabetes? People tend to have low insulin. It can help insulin resistance as well. Here it is in the blood, and it's helping uh, prevent cancer. And here it is helping the immune system, helping to uh, activate the immune system for good things and unactivate it for bad things. So this is from a scientific article trying to let us doctors know how it all works. And I hope that picture makes it a little easier for you. What could happen if your vitamin D was a little bit low? We discovered, low vi we discovered vitamin D because of a disease that happened to kids. Maybe you heard of it, called rickets. You see, rickets was not a problem until the Industrial Revolution. And we st started moving from the countryside, where we got lots of sunshine, into the cities where there were narrow streets and tenements and the kids just weren't getting any sunshine. Without the sunshine, they didn't make the vitamin D. Without the vitamin D, they wouldn't absorb the calcium. But nobody knew that. It was one of those strange things. What causes rickets? And they looked for infections and they looked for toxins and all kinds of things. Finally, one doctor figured it out. He, it was technology. He got an electrical arc, and I don't remember exactly what the two elements were, but he made an electrical arc, and then he would you know, get the kids down so they were in their skivvies and have them stand in front of it, and their rickets would go away. Hooray for technology. And then another doctor discovered that all he had to do was take the kids up to the roof of the hospital. And that would do the same thing, right? Get them into the sunshine. And from there, we, we began to understand what vitamin D was. It was discovered as something that when it's deficient, it causes rickets. How long ago was that? How long ago? I don't remember how long ago that was, but it's been like 100 years, 150 years, something like that. It doesn't go back to the 1700s for sure. I think probably late 1800s, but it could have been early 19, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know that. Well, what happens when, uh, oh, before we go to that, let me uh, talk to you about these pictures of the kids so you can understand what rickets is. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, there are three children on the right-hand side, three girls. The one in the middle does not have rickets. The one on the right and the left, both are shorter. One has bowed legs, and the other one has knock knees, you see? So without the vitamin D, they're short because there wasn't enough calcium put in the bones, and the bones are weak, so the knees tend to knock or are bow out. This child on the left, <clears throat> has what we call a rickettsial rosary. That is, the ribs are trying to make uh, or put calcium into them. The, the protein is going down, but the body isn't putting the calcium. So they get a series of bumps all along the edge of the ribs here, or where the, the soft bone is trying to turn into hard bone. And it's called a rickettsial rosary. So we uh, recognized this disease, and we found that vitamin D would make it go away. It helps the calcium get in. Our pr present recommended daily allowance 
for vitamin D is based on a few early studies done a long time ago on how much vitamin D you need to prevent rickets. It has not been updated for cancer prevention or diabetes prevention or uh, immune system benefit. What do we call it in adults? If you have enough vitamin D when you're growing up, you'll get to the right height, you'll have calcium in your bones, you won't have the bumps, you won't have the bowed legs. But if you get an office job and you're working indoors, it could very well happen that your own bones get thin. And when that happens, we call it osteomalacia. As that advances, it goes to, you've heard of it, osteoporosis. Not enough calcium in the bones as they get weak. Uh, there's a little swelling sometimes if the bones are tender. Sometimes people have kind of aches from this. We'll talk a little more about it. But osteomalacia can cause some pain and achiness in the bones. Osteoporosis, of course, is when the, the bone fractures and you break a hip or a wrist or a back or um, that's osteoporosis. This uh, next one gives you a little bit of a feel from the scientific si standpoint. Here's the uh, bone fracture relative risk. People who are taking uh, adequate amounts of vitamin D and then those that have a, a decrease. And you can see that the, am I just saying that right? Those that got the adequate amounts of vitamin D have lower uh, fracture risks. That's from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Here's another one that happens, and this one is a little hard to uh, explain. It's uh, a little complicated and frustrating. Let me uh, kind of introduce it this way. In medical school, I was taught that if I wanted to really get ahead, what I needed to do was read about the disease that we were going to be studying about in lecture before I went to lecture. So I, have you ever heard this before? If you read about it first, then you understand more what the teachers about. And I just never had time for that. But one time we had a whole bunch of tests, and then I had some spare time. And I said, I am going to read about our next lecture, and I'm going to, get it, I'm going to do it right this time. I'm going to really learn it. And I opened the book, and we were reading about parathyroid hormone and hyperparathyroidism. And so I read it, and I did my best to memorize the list of things that happened with hyperparathyroidism. Man, that was a hard list. I couldn't find patterns or anything. And I finally said, I guess this is just too hard for me. And I went to class. And the first thing the teacher said is, we're going to be studying hyperparathyroidism today. And uh, don't try to memorize all the symptoms. <laughs> well, that made me feel better. He said, it's the great imitator. It acts like everything or anything, all kinds of things. And let's look at this symptom list. Gastrointestinal, that is the stomach and intestines. Thirst, that is thirsty all the time. Polydipsia, drinking a lot of water. Polyuria, peeing a lot. What does that sound like? Diabetes. Ulcers, what does that sound like? Stress, okay, or heliobacter is an infection that can cause it. Pancreatitis might be from high triglycerides or too much alcohol. Constipation, that could be from low thyroid. Vomiting and weight loss. Now, don't try to get, lose weight this way. It's really a poor way to do that. So you see, it's a great imitator. In the musculoskeletal area, you're, you recognize the fractures, if you have osteoporosis, of course, and vertebral collapse, osteoporosis, joint pains, gout, pseudogout, and even calcifications. Anybody had a heel spur or a shoulder spur? That could be related to hyperparathyroidism, or, and hyperparathyroidism comes from a low vitamin D level. Fatigue, apathy, anxiety, depression, and even psychosis. Wow, the list just keeps right on going. Somnolence means I'm sleepy all the time. Coma means I'm out cold and don't know what's going on. Muscle fatigue, weakness, and hypotonia. More than one person who thought they were just overweight and achy, <laughs> weak, actually has a vitamin D deficiency. It's something that needs to be checked. And then in the cardiovascular, hypertension and a short a change in the EKG. Hyper, I have seen people that came in like two or three medications. As a matter of fact, about two months after I got here, 
<clears throat> one of my residents came to me and uh, said, look, here's this person with high blood pressure. They're on three blood pressure medications. What should we do next? I said, please check a vitamin D level. This person is at high risk. They work indoor, indoors. They had dark skin. Get that vitamin D level fixed, and you may not need any of those medications. Well, uh, she told me later that she kind of laughed at me and said, who is this crazy new doc? But then she did it, and it was right. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Uh, hypertension may be simply from a low vitamin D. Come next time to hear more about hypertension. So it's the great imitator. We'll come back and talk a little more about that. Here's another disease that may be related to vitamin D. It, vitamin D deficiency is not the only thing that causes psoriasis. But I've actually had patients that came to me with psoriasis. I checked their vitamin D level. It was low. I replaced it, and their psoriasis went away. And that would make sense. Psoriasis is skin cells that have lost their terminal differentiation. They're growing too fast. You get all those scales. And if it's a vitamin D deficiency, Vitamin A deficiency may also be related, and sometimes there's an interaction. But psoriasis may be from a related to a vitamin D deficiency. Here's another one, type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is different than type 2. Type 2 diabetes comes, for those of you who have heard me talk about this before, too much energy in and not enough energy out. Type 1 diabetes is completely different. An infection comes into the body, and it attacks the pancreas. It attacks the cells in the pancreas that make the insulin. It doesn't happen with every virus. But the immune system, looking at that virus attacking the pancreatic cells, gets confused. And instead of attacking just the virus, it starts to attack the pancreatic cells. And when it kills those, the cells that make insulin die, and that means there's no insulin. It's an autoimmune disease. The body got confused and fought the cells that it shouldn't. So type 1 diabetes, this is from the Finnish type 1 diabetes prediction and prevention study. We used to call this juvenile diabetes because it hits kids. And, and in Finland, they live way to the north, and how much vitamin D do you think they get? Well, not very much, certainly in the winter. So it was a good place to study, and they looked at some kids over, it looked like about 31 years, they gave the kids... Uh, some of them randomly assigned them to get a 2,000 international units of vitamin D per day. Well, they found that as time progressed, there was an 80% decrease in type 1 diabetes. Did something to help balance that immune system so it didn't get quite so confused. Fascinating. You didn't, even th you didn't think, I'm sure, that vitamin D would be stepping on the toes of diabetes. Here's another one. <clears throat> Uh, down at the bottom, it says cancers, and I've already introduced that to you. Colon, breast, prostate, ovarian, lymphoma, and leukemia, all associated with low vitamin D levels. An early study uh, done, well, 1975 to 1983 by the Garland brothers in San Diego. They looked at people, and they measured their vitamin D levels in their blood, and then they watched them over time to see how many people got colon cancer. And what they found was in people with higher levels of vitamin D compared to the lowest, that is 27 to 32, there was a 75% reduction in colon cancer. When they looked at the higher level still from 33 to 41, they found an 80% reduction in colon cancer. Now, we've known for years that the further away you live from the equator, the more likely you are to have colon cancer. Now, this gives us an explanation. When you live close to the equator, you're more likely to get sun, and that sun helps slow down that terminal differentiation, right? Keep it under control so the uh, body doesn't make cancer as easily. So that's good news, kind of opening your eyes here. Vitamin D <clears throat> is also strongly associated with falls in the elderly. Now, as we get older, we tend to uh, stay indoors a little more, don't we? Uh, we don't like those old age spots. We're going to try to stay out of the sun. And <clears throat> it ends up vitamin D levels can get low, and people actually fall more easily. Now, I thought maybe the problem was um, we've had this argument. When I was in medical school, I heard it. People, uh, as they get older, tend to have broken hips, right? 
Do broken hips come because somebody falls and hits the hip, or does somebody's hip break and then they fall? I heard that argument. I, I think it happens both ways, and I wondered if maybe low vitamin D might make the spontaneous fractures more likely to happen, but it actually goes beyond that. Fascinating study looking at a group of, of older folks, looking at their vitamin D levels, see if I can get this right, from very low up to uh, higher, and then this is uh, what the physical therapists have done to evaluate people's ability to get up out of a chair and move, the, an evaluation of their physical ability. And look what happens. You can see, as they looked at this cross-sectionally, that the higher the vitamin D level, the higher the people's function was, the less likely there was to be trouble. Now, this study had two parts. One of it was to just evaluate a bunch of old folks, and then the second one was to take those that were low in vitamin D and replace it and continue to watch them over time. And we see the same thing as their vitamin D levels go up, their function improves. Muscles get stronger, they're steadier, much less likely to fall. So it's much more than just the bones. It's also muscle strength. And I have heard that uh, story uh, before from individuals. Anybody ever heard of multiple sclerosis? Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the body, the immune system starts to fight the insulation that's on the nerves of the body. So it's an immune imbalance. And science is telling us, this, is, uh, this particular study was done on U.S. military personnel. They're a great group to study for this because they tend to come in young and they'll stay for an amount of time, but the military has blood tests on everybody. <laughs> so they could do the vitamin D levels and see what happened. And they found that uh, at least for Caucasians, the uh, higher the vitamin D level, the lower the risk of multiple sclerosis. It was not true for African Americans. Why? Or Hispanics. Probably the skin is darker. There is less vitamin D made in the sun and we can, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. And since there are so many that are low, you couldn't see the spread of, of high to low in those populations. Vitamin D deficiency in rheumatoid arthritis. This is from the Iowa Women's Health Study. This is uh, one of those studies they went back to look at. It's much better to do blood levels when you're trying to look at these predictive models. But all they had in the Iowa Women's Health Study, not the blood, all they had was their dietary intake. So they looked at dietary intake and they said people who got vitamin D, were they uh, plenty of vitamin D in their diet, were they less likely to have rheumatoid arthritis? And the answer is yes. Surprise. Type 2 diabetes and vitamin D. Now this ended up being quite fascinating to me. It was reported in 2004 in uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They took people with type 2 diabetes who had low vitamin D levels and then replaced the vitamin D and measured to see how strong their pancreas was and how much insulin resistance they had. They found a, about a 60% improvement in insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion when they increase the vitamin D levels. So people with type 2 diabetes should really have their vitamin D levels checked and then get them optimized, don't you think? I think so too. Let's see. This is a repeat, a different study uh, looking at a whole bunch of uh, people with, uh, uh, again, Finnish cohort study looking at uh, by, uh, type 2 diabetes in the, and preventing it with people with higher levels of vitamin D. And there is an association there as well. Um, <clears throat> I guess this is another study, or I've got several of them here, and uh, all significant showing that, yes, vitamin D can make a difference in uh, people risk for type 2 diabetes. Now this one looks at something called congestive heart failure. Now vitamin D deficiency, I don't know that I would say it causes congestive heart failure, but certainly if your vitamin D is low, it can make the whole process worse. And if you have congestive heart failure, it's worthwhile getting it checked. Uh, this is kind of is a, from a couple of scientific articles that we're looking at associations the cause and effect relationship is not proven here. 
Now this one ends up being interesting, musculoskeletal pain. Uh, what these uh, folks did was uh, to look in the emergency department of 150 consecutive patients who were complaining of muscle and joint type pains. I got back pain or my, my leg hurts or if it was musculoskeletal, they just did vitamin D levels on them to see what happened. <laughs> What they found was African Americans, East Africans, Hispanic, and Native Americans, uh, virtually 100% of them were deficient in vitamin D. Wow. If they took all patients, there were 93% which were deficient. Remember the hyperparathyroidism that comes from low vitamin D? One of the symptoms was aches and pains in joints. And especially in the North Country, that's why you moved to Florida, isn't it? To get away from the North Country. But in the, that was February through June, so we're talking about kind of end of winter. That's the time when people are going to be, tend to be lower in vitamin D. Uh, it made uh, quite a difference. These people were diagnosed with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and depression. Okay? That's what the ER doc called them before they left. Of course, they had the blood tests, found the vitamin D deficiency. And those things, interestingly enough, sometimes are caused by vitamin D deficiency. Pregnancy. You think it might make a difference in pregnancy? Yes, it does. A uh, fascinating study done in the United Kingdom, that is, over in England. Uh, they looked at a bunch of pregnancies. During the pregnancy, they found about 31% insufficient. This fits uh, fairly well with uh, one of my friends who's an OBGYN in Tennessee. Now, that's not too far north. And he was finding something like 30 to 50% of his OB patients, when he was checking them, were deficient. So it, it, is, it can happen, and it does happen. So <clears throat> in this group, uh, England, fairly uh, far to the north, uh, they found a uh, decrease in the bone mineral content of the kids at nine years of age. Of mothers, compared with mothers who had the higher vitamin Ds with the lower, they found calcium deficiency, bone mass decrease in kids at nine years of age because of mother's vitamin D status. So that makes us worry a little bit. Low maternal vitamin D levels and child bone mass uh, was uh, predicted by exposure to sunlight, the UVB, uh, UV, uh, exposure, and then uh, supplements. And then they did some work with uh, uh, umbilicus, uh, the, the blood in the cord as well. Uh, <clears throat> this was fascinating to me. I was just reviewing a little bit, preparing for a uh, lecture tonight, and I found this one. Uh, it looks like gestational vitamin D deficiency may have something to do with schizophrenia. If you look at animals with vitamin D deficiency, the th changes in the brain are the same that happen in schizophrenia. We haven't proven this yet in human beings, but uh, it sure looks suspicious. Animal model, gene disruption, and large lateral ventricles, decrease in the nerve growth factor, and then some epidemiologic association as well. We've been able to see by looking at people with schizophrenia and finding lower vitamin D levels. So, yes? His question is, do you get schizophrenia because of a low vitamin D level? And will it go away if you replace the vitamin D? The answer is, this is gestational. That is, this is what's going on in your mama's tummy that makes the difference. That's when the brain is developing. As I doubt it makes any difference in adulthood because brain is already developed, but it's a developmental thing. That's what the science is kind of looking at right now. Boy, if I were pregnant, I would sure want to make sure my vitamin D level was adequate. Would you? So that's what, that's what you're talking about there, then. They want to make sure that when the mother's carrying, when mother is carrying the baby, the there's an adequate amount of vitamin D. You don't want to come up short on that. I have no idea. I kind of doubt that it would make schizophrenia get better. I, I mean, that's, this is brain development sort of a thing. But the changes in the brains of animals with vitamin D deficiency are the same as the changes in the brains of humans with schizophrenia. So that looks really suspicious. Not proven yet, but really suspicious. Well, 
more vitamin D you should have. The further north you go, the more vitamin D you should take. Yes, if you're, to make sure that you don't get low. Because, because, uh, because uh, the further north you are, the less sunshine you get into. Of course, remember, uh, there's an awful lot of people in Florida who are running around you know, trying to stay out of the sun, and it could be the same problem here, too. We'll talk a little bit about absorption, and I think it's a good idea to get tested occasionally. I hope that you all go home to your doctors. Which one are you going to check? 25-hydroxy vitamin D. I hope you've got it written down. Yes, ma'am. Can you get too much? Can you get too much vitamin D? We will talk about that. You can get too much, and uh, vitamin D is the second most toxic of the vitamins, so we want to be in a safe range, and we'll go there before we get done. Now this is from a 2008 article from the Archives of Internal Medicine looking at cardiovascular risk and all-cause mortality in people with vitamin D levels. People with low vitamin D levels uh, here have adequate amounts of vitamin D. When it was insufficient, and in this one they called the levels between 10 and 30, the risk went up about 50% for all-cause mortality. For people who were deficient, that is less than 10, it was 2.3 times as much likely to die. That is, the risk of dying was up 2.3 times with the low vitamin D. Uh, this is looking at it with in all-cause mortality in people who had no heart disease. So no heart disease, so that shouldn't be the, the cause of it, but yet mortality is very high, 4.6 times in the 7.7 .7 years that they did the study looking at the vitamin D levels. And here it is in, uh, with cardiovascular mortality, you can see that heart attacks are more likely to happen as your vitamin D level goes down as well. And here's some uh, nice survival curves. You can see people, this is 100%, uh, that is everybody's alive at the beginning of the study. You're looking out at eight years. People with the lowest vitamin D had the most death, and that's down to about 0.6 here. So it's about a 40% of the people died uh, in this population. Those with a 13, 19, and 28, and you can see as they get up to the higher levels of vitamin D, mortality from all cause is much better. So your vitamin D makes, I mean, it's important for you, isn't it? Are you convinced yet? <clears throat> there are seasonal variations in vitamin D. The difference between March and August, that is end of winter and end of summer, uh, there's a significant difference in uh, some areas. This is from that same scientific article. You can see average level in March was 12, average level in August was 22. It depends on sun exposure. Uh, this is a, an interesting study looking at uh, over 3,200 people. One-fourth were deficient with a, le a level that was really low, less than 10. Two-thirds were insufficient. Uh, that is, they had levels that were, this says less than 20. And then 75% were less than the recommended level of 30. So there's a lot of people who don't have enough vitamin D. Could you be one of them? When I started to study this, I said, I wonder what my level was, is. Yeah. So I had my level done, and my level was 12. It would be much better if it were closer, you know, above 30, and, and up to 50 would be even better. Here's some uh, now from populations, and this is estimated across the world. One billion people worldwide are, uh, have low vitamin D, 40 to 100 percent of elderly men and women. 50% of postmenopausal women have levels less than optimal, that is less than the 30. 52% of Hispanic and black adolescents in Boston, one study showed, had in, uh, uh, deficient levels. 48% of white pre-adolescent girls in Maine, now that's pretty far north, isn't it? So these are even the kids. 42% of those 15 to 49, and this is in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. The, the government does this every 10 years to evaluate our health. They do a lot of studies on these folks, and, and they found quite a few people were deficient. And then 
they went into a hospital in Boston to look at the health care workers, you know, the, the doctors, the students, the physicians, the residents. They found 32% of them were deficient. This is trying to bring it home to the doctors. It's important. When you live in a hospital all the time and you never see the sunlight, why, it can be deadly. So now we're looking at levels and... Uh, <clears throat> Deficient is called less than 20. Insufficient is between 20 and 29. And uh, the best way, best place for you to be is uh, to have uh, something over 30. Okay? That would be ideal. Uh, or, or best. Over 50 would be even better. Okay, now the big question. To what time? Not more than 150, because that's where toxicity begins. If you went out, and we'll be covering this a little bit more, but if you went out in the sun and like surfed all day, your level would never go over 100. But it could run up around 90. So <clears throat> that would be a normal high for those of us who are in the sun all the time. That gives you a, a range. That's how low these folks are that are less than 10. Pretty scary. Where are you supposed to get vitamin D? Does anybody know? Milk. <laughs> Who puts the vitamin D in the milk? The cow does not. The, the folks who prepare the milk do it because the public health department solved Ricketts' problem by putting vitamin D in milk. And because the cow does not put the vitamin D in the milk, and the manufacturers only put the vitamin D that's extra expense, where they're told to, you won't get vitamin D from cheese, or cottage cheese, or ice cream. Other dairy products don't have it, it's just in milk. Now, several years ago, and this looks like it was done in, uh, reported in 1993, some uh, <clears throat> scientists went out to the shelves and pulled milk off the shelf, and on it it said vitamin D and said how much was in there. Then they took that milk to the lab, and they wanted to see if the vitamin D was really there. Were the manufacturers or the processors putting it in? Well, look at this. They found that, uh, see if I can get this group, 20% of, of the milk had uh, over 120% of the vitamin D. That is, it had more vitamin D, okay? And here's less than 5%, that is almost none, about as close to zero as you can, 37%. They just hadn't been putting it in. And then you have 14%, which was on target, and then those that were low, 5 to 80% of what the label said was uh, 20%. So we're looking here at the majority of the milk just didn't have the vitamin D in there to what they said. Yes, ma'am. What about soy milk? Well, uh, the soy bean doesn't have vitamin D in it either. But because it is a milk substitute and milk has vitamin D in it, those who make soy milk and sell it to us do tend to put vitamin D in. And you can check on the carton to see if it's there. Unfortunately, this vitamin D is not absorbed as well as we would like if we take it orally. So generally, we think we get our vitamin D from cows. But it's not all that good a source because it's not that well absorbed. <clears throat> You could uh, take cod liver oil. Anybody like cod liver oil? You'd have to take an awful lot of this to get adequate amount of vitamin D. Uh, I asked if anybody once in a lecture if anybody liked vitamin D. One person raised uh, the vitamin D that liked cod liver oil, and one person raised their hand and said, "Oh yeah, I like it." They were immediately ostracized by everybody else. Okay? <laughs> it's what your mom made you take, right? Remember when we were really young to try to make sure we were healthy. Well, the other way to get it is with supplements. <clears throat> and we want to be careful about supplements because, as we pointed out, too much can cause trouble. Uh, too little vitamin D tends to make uh, our body increase the parathyroid hormone, which pulls calcium out of the bones. Too much vitamin D tends to pull too much calcium into our body from the intestines. And many of the symptoms, believe it or not, are similar. You can have calcifications, like the heel spur or the, or the shoulder spur, hypertension, uh, anorexia that is not hungry, nausea, weakness, the polyuria, polydipsia. So similar type symptoms from a lot of vitamin D because it's pulling too much calcium into the body from the intestines. We'll need to be careful about that. 
So where do you get supplemental vitamin D? Well, it can come from two places. There's a vitamin D2. This one is ergosterol. It's a little different than the one that we make in our skin. The one we make in our skin is uh, vitamin D3 or the 7 dehydroxysterol. And that's made from lanolin if you get it as a supplement. So one is from yeast, the vitamin D2, for people who want to have only plant-based, and there are some people who don't want any animal products at all, then you would need to take the uh, vitamin D2, which is made from yeast. They radiate the yeast, and it has the cholesterol-like molecule that can be changed. But that's only one-third as effective as the kind that we usually use. This one, vitamin D3, the, the, the one that comes from <coughs> kind of animal sources, comes from radiating lanolin. You know what lanolin is? Well, we, it was in, uh, it kind of keeps our skin soft, right? But lanolin is, is a found in sheep sweat, <laughs> right? So I like to think of it as sheep sweat. Sometimes people who are trying to be vegans and stay away from all animal products will say, oh, I don't want to take that. That's an animal source. And I tell them, oh, that's not animal. That's from sheep sweat, okay? <laughs> so that's, that kind of puts it in perspective. Any other sources of vitamin D? Yes, we've talked about sunlight. And uh, sunlight never causes toxic levels. 90, maybe 100 would be the highest anybody would go with a lot of sunlight. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Hollick was one of the, I call him Dr. Vitamin D. He's the one who's kind of done a bunch of this research. I listened to him lecture on it, and he described taking medical students and putting them in the sun, you know, take most of their clothes off, put them in the sun until they get pink all over. Pink all over is minimal erythema dose, <laughs> MED, minimal erythema dose. And then you measure their vitamin D level beforehand, you measure the vitamin D level afterwards, and you say, how much vitamin D is made by getting pink all over? You don't want a sunburn, but just pink. And what he found was 10 to 20,000 international units was about what's made by getting pink all over. There's some variation. The more your skin sees the sun, the more effective it is in making vitamin D. So, for example, <coughs> If I go out in the sun, because I, when I was younger, I did quite a bit of construction, and my arms were out in the sun a lot. If I go out in the sun, my, I, I, I may get a little bit of a tan, but I don't burn very easily, because that skin is very good at making vitamin D, and it has the pre, kind of vitamin D there, the cholesterol there, ready to get changed into, and that protects me from the sun burn, at least in generic? part. What's that? Is that generic? Now, what's generic? Oh, genetic. Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the color, of, the color of skin, but what I'm talking about now is how efficient the skin is. If I were to go out and sunbathe in the buff, okay, then there would be a band around here that has never seen the sun, and that would burn very quickly. But if that was shown the sun on a regular basis, that skin would get better and better at making vitamin D. So the skin kind of learns how to do that. If it's skin new to the sun, you'll burn more easily. Yes, sir? Um, how often do you have to be out in the sun to keep up what you're supposed to have? And are there certain parts of the skin that are better? It's the ones that are, have seen the sun a lot that are best at making vitamin D, obviously. When I'm out in the yard, I'm out on the yard all the time. All I do is wear shorts. It'll be very, I, you probably don't have vitamin D deficiency, which is good. Now, I, I've been, I, this whole business of doing medical students, I, I've, I've got to share this with you. It's a terrible little um, uh, mental image that I have. When I listened to Dr. Hollick talk about what he was doing to the medical students, and he was getting them pink all over, I saw a tall, modern hospital in downtown Boston with medical students on a spit, kind of turning. <laughs> <laughs> Right? When, when you do the calculation, the RDA has uh, been raised up to about 600 international units. Do the calculation. If you get minimal erythema all over, you make 10 to 20,000. How much of your skin needs to be shown? Well, it's about 6% of your body exposed for 15 minutes three times a week. 
So it doesn't take all that much to get the RDA. Now, the truth is, we need more than the RDA, so you may want a little more than that, but that would be the minimum as calculated uh, uh, from the numbers that uh, Dr. Hollick found. Yes, sir. Down here, where we are in central Florida, does it make a difference whether it's early morning sun or midday? He asks, does it make a difference whether it's early morning sun, midday? <clears throat> Whenever you can get a sunburn, you can make vitamin D. If you can't get a sunburn, if it's too early in the morning, you won't. So between 10 and 2 is the time when you would actually make the most. Of course, that's when you get more skin damage. I mean, there's, there's that balance that you're going to look for. Are you going to cover, you were saying that that would be the minimum, that 600, you know, that uh, international... We'll, we'll talk a little bit about where we, we really want to be. It'll be coming in a little bit. Special situations. When you put sunscreen on, now this is an SPF of 8. SPF of 8 blocks between 95 and 98 percent of the vitamin D formation. So when you lather up to protect your skin, you're also not getting the vitamin D. Okay, so that's an important one. Is that, does that include the same oil? Well, no, that includes the sunblocks that have things like PABA in them. It, it should not uh, include plain oil. If you're in the winter, north of 35 latitude, now that's about Oklahoma City, if you want to kind of look at it that way, you can be out on, <laughs> on the rooftop naked all day and not make any vitamin D because the sun never gets high enough. So greater than 35 latitude in the winter, especially the north country, is a concern. I've mentioned dark skin already. Up to 50 times the exposure for the very dark skinned uh, African-American to make the same amount of vitamin D that uh, a Caucasian would make. 30 to 50 percent of uh, African-Americans are deficient. Uh, if I look at NHANES data, and I will quote, virtually 100 percent of African-Americans have insufficient vitamin D. So there's an awful lot of deficiency. In my opinion, all African Americans should be screened. And when they come into my office, I, I order that test. And the darker your skin, the more likely you are to need extra, okay? Because the pigment in the skin that makes the skin dark also absorbs that very same wavelength. So it's important. If your brother's a little, or you're darker than your brother, then you're going to need a little more sun than he does. Now, this is fascinating. Uh, let me, this is kind of uh, continuing the point here. This is a, uh, the health professional study looking at uh, African Americans, black skinned uh, health professionals, comparing them to white and looking at incidence of colon cancer. So there were African Americans at low risk for vitamin D deficiency. What would that mean? They had hobbies or jobs that got them outside. They were not milk intolerant. About 50% of African Americans have lactose deficiency, so they get diarrhea and stomach upset when they drink milk. So they, those would be low risk, people who could drink milk and worked outdoors. And then uh, if you looked at those people, you could see that it made no difference in their risk of cancer or death. But if you looked at the African Americans who couldn't take milk and worked indoors all the time, you saw an increase in cancer uh, of about almost 60 percent and all-cause mortality about two point two and a quarter times as much uh, death, that is mortality, all-cause mortality. So some of the differences in health of African Americans may be related to inadequate vitamin D levels. This was fascinating uh, uh, work uh, which I think needs to be paid attention to. This pattern was, give, was even more pronounced for digestive sense, uh, system cancer, particular colon cancer. Our results suggest that the high frequency of hypovitaminosis D in blacks may be an important and easily modifiable contributor to their higher risk of cancer incidence and mortality. Yes, sir. That's correct. 
the, the pigment that comes will tend to decrease the amount of vitamin D that's made. Although the more your skin sees the sun, the more efficient it is. So it's, it's a couple things. It's two things happening together, and it's protecting in the middle. It's a good question. Uh, let's see. Older skin. <laughs> the older we get, the less efficient we are at making especially the pre-vitamin D. By 70 years of age, there's a 75% decrease in the ability to make the pre-vitamin D. So none of us are getting off the hook very easily here, are we? People who are overweight, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it goes where our fat is. If you happen to be overweight, then you've got a bigger container to fill up with vitamin D, <laughs> meaning it's got to stretch further. And you, the truth is, I haven't seen a lot of obese people at the beach in bikinis. Have you noticed that? <laughs> people tend to stay inside when they get overweight, and they te tend to keep themselves covered. So obese people are at higher risk for having vitamin D deficiency. So much so, sometimes, and I've warned my young doctors about this. You know, someone comes in overweight with joint and muscle pain, don't say, well, if you'd lose weight, things would be better. I mean, it, they may be better if you lost weight, but check that vitamin D level, because that could be low. And that may be causing the joint pain, and people can't lose weight unless they can exercise. So let's do the best we can for folks. Babies. Uh, <clears throat> If mama's vitamin D level is low, there won't be any vitamin D in the breast milk. So mama has to have plenty. Some doctors are arguing with the increase in rickets now that uh, babies should be given a shot of vitamin D before they leave the hospital. Uh, especially in the North Country, you know, they wrap them up and they never see the light of day for quite some time. So uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, may be important. Children. Rickets is increasing in our world now. The pediatric literature is full talking about it. Why do you think it is? Do you think it's those tenements? Do you think it has something to do with computers and video games? Yeah, there may very well be some truth to that. And I'm worried about it. Here's one, a study looking at uh, some kids in Saudi Arabia. Have you heard of Saudi Arabia? When it rains four days out of the year, right? So it's sunshine all the time, but there's so much sunshine, they all go around covered up. And the kids stay indoors until it cools down in the evening, and then they come outside to play. 25% of the children in Saudi Arabia in one study that done there showed them to be deficient. So just because we live where sun is doesn't mean that we're actually going to get enough. We have to get into it. Fibromyalgia. More than one person with the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is supposed to be rule out anything that can cause it, and then we find say, okay, it's fibromyalgia because we can't find anything for it, right? Well, more than one person has been found on closer look to be vitamin D deficient as the cause of their symptoms. It generally takes, once you replace it, three to four months before that fibromyalgia symptoms will go away, but if vitamin D deficiency is the cause of your fibromyalgia, that's the best treatment of it. That is not just a woman's disease, although more women get it than men, it seems. So, what are the recommendations? Well, get some sun every day. Not enough to burn. You don't want the skin cancer, but get enough sun to make the vitamin D. Uh, if you're going to the beach and you're going to be using sunblock, why not wait 15 or 20 minutes before putting on your sunblock? So you can get some of that, those rays and make some of that vitamin D. We need to let the public know. I'm glad you all have come out to learn. You'll be able to tell some other folks and pass the message on. This is an incredibly important public health issue that I wish more was being done with. Supplement people at high risk, which seems to be a lot of us, right? Diagnose and treat to a target. A deficiency is less than 20, insufficiency is between 20 and 30. We'd like to get our levels up between 40 and 60 to get optimal uh, uh, levels. Now, how much should you actually take? I was at the American College of Nutrition meetings here about a year and a half ago in Orlando, and uh, there was a whole kind of seminar on the vitamin D. They had four scientists talking. And after the, they all did their talks, then there was the question answer period. And the first thing that happens is somebody raises their hand and says, 
How much vitamin D do you guys take? <laughs> and they said, well, we talked just before we came up. And uh, we we're all taking 5,000 international units a day. It looks, it seems that it's safe up to about 10,000 international units a day. There's some argument about that. Uh, but these guys are taking 5,000. One of them was actually giving a talk about uh, uh, some of the genetics of vitamin D, and there's about 20% of the population that have a relative insufficiency, or it's, it's not quite as efficient in making, the, it's called the one alpha hydroxylase in our cells. And in order to overcome that, it's a hard thing to test for, it's a research thing, we don't do that for everybody. Uh, I, I, I don't know that you can order in the lab, so it's a research sort of a thing. But <clears throat> what they were saying is to get over that hurdle for everybody, 5,000 international units a day is a great uh, uh, level. That's what they were taking. So that's what I started to do, and that's how much I'm taking. Now the RDA is 600, right? And that needs to be increased because if you get no sunlight whatsoever, your oral needs are 1,000, okay? If you're getting no sunlight and you're just trying to hold your level steady, then you need 1,000. You can easily go up to 2,000. That right now is the upper end of recommendation from the uh, RDA. Uh, the, what yes. about for children? What about for children? The first study I saw on high doses ran kids up to 10,000 and found no toxicity at all. I, and uh, 5,000 should be fine. Uh, I check levels to find out, you know, what happened. So I want to know about where they are. I'd like people around 50. I think that would be a real good level. I just spoke with somebody uh, yesterday who told me their doctor had told them, get it up to about 70. So, so you were saying yours was at 12 at one time? Mine was as low as 12. That is okay. correct. I haven't checked it since I was on the 5,000, but just before I started the 5,000, I was at 32. Oh, okay. well, that's yeah. And how often do you check it? Well, n n once I know that it's up, the test is expensive, and they have to put needles in your arm, and I'm allergic to pain. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'll just take the 5,000, and next time I have my blood drawn, I'll have them do it, you know. Yes. Well, it doesn't cause vitamin D toxicity. You can get sunburn and skin cancer. Okay. Okay. So. How does it get toxicity? That is, you take the supplements and then you're out in the sun a lot. Could you make it go too high? Is that what you're asking? Oh. You don't really want to go there. I, there was a list of them up here, and it's too much calcium in your blood. It can cause, you know, too much urination, too much thirst. It can cause muscle aches and pains. So it can, the same symptoms that we got from too little are also caused by too much. Because, but the, it's the calcium in the blood. Is it from the hyperparathyroidism or is it from the vitamin D effects on the gut? So it's, it's a very interesting kind of situation. I didn't answer you very well, but it was the best I could do. There was another... What about the tanning bed? Anything that will give you a sunburn will make vitamin D. The tanning bed will make vitamin D. But the tanning beds have UVB and UVA. UVA is not blocked by the sunblock, does not help with the vitamin D formation, and really increases your risk of skin cancer. So yes, you could do that, and yes, you'd make vitamin D, but I don't, those tanning beds, I wouldn't recommend those. I have, I, I looked at this once. I, you know, we, you got these big walk-in closets, right? Yeah. We get up in the morning in our night clothes. We go into the walk-in closet. We take our clothes off for the night, put on clothes for the day. I said to myself, wouldn't it make sense to have a sun lamp in there? Yeah. <laughs> so when I have my clothes off, then I'm getting... I couldn't find one that they would sell me for a reasonable price, so. But it was a thought. I, I thought the pills were cheaper. Yes, ma'am. Uh, any idea of how long you would stay with your nutrition? Just a guesstimate? If I find somebody that's deficient, and when I found my level at uh, 12, 
I took Dr. Hollick's recommendation. I took 50,000 international units once a week for a month, and then I rechecked my level. Now, I was on a very low-fat diet, and vitamin D is fat-soluble. So when you, it goes in with fat, because I was on such a low-fat diet, with all that vitamin D, my vi it's not absorbed all that well. My vitamin D level went from 12 to 14. I had some of, my, uh, some of my patients who had the same problem. What we had to do was to add a teaspoon of oil to the meal that we took the vitamin D, and then it was much better absorbed. Then I jumped up to the 28. Yeah, uh, what I did was I put a teaspoon of olive oil on my salad, and the same meal that I took the, it doesn't have to be mixed together, it'll find it in the stomach. But as the oil is absorbed, the vitamin D then goes in with it. See, for instance, when I made popcorn, I put olive oil on the popcorn. That would do it. That, there's, enough, there's enough olive oil on your popcorn so the vitamin D can mix with it, sure. But that's a huge dose, isn't it? 50,000 international units. Now, to, the truth is that is the um, uh, vitamin D2, so it's only about a third as effective as the D3. And I, I will, especially in people that are overweight with very low levels and have diabetes or something I'm trying to correct quickly, I will put people on 50,000 two or three times a week, sometimes every other day. So you take the two? So I take the two. So uh, right now I take vitamin D3, but those big doses are given with vitamin D2. You can't buy those big doses in vitamin D3. They only come in D2. And they're prescription, so you can't go out and get them yourself. You have to have a prescription to get them. You could hurt yourself with those. Yeah. That's why we have to check the levels. Yeah. How often would you, have, would you request the doctor to check your... How often would you uh, uh, ask the doctor to check your vitamin D level? Well, if you find yourself at risk, now, <laughs> okay? And then I think it should be uh, aggressively treated. Some people would say, oh, it's too much trouble to go to the doctor and get my laboratory test done. I'll just take 5,000 international units a day or 2,000 or whatever. Well, you'd <laughs> it can take a long time for it to get up. And if you're having health problems from it, you're, you're really setting yourself behind. Do it. Get it up there and then do enough to maintain. So that, to me that makes the most sense. So what I would do would be to treat somebody aggressively. I'd take their level. Oh, they're low. Level of eight, let's say. And, and then I would treat them for six weeks, maybe two or three times a week, and I'd recheck their level. How is it now? If it's good, then I'll say, okay, what's maintenance? If it's not, then I'll do it again until I get the level up where it belongs. Complete blood count, if you have a complete blood count done, that doesn't mean a vitamin D. It has to be written on there in particular, so uh, ask for it. And I had difficulty getting it done. I ended up having to go to GYN to get it. Some doctors are a little resistant because they haven't heard the science. It takes a little while for it to get out to the everyday average doctor, which is why, uh, and here let me give you a couple of clues here, okay? <clears throat> On that website that I gave you, that www.aclm-articles.net is a, a folder. There's one that says lectures where you can find the vitamin D lecture. There's another one that says vitamin D. And if you'll go in there, you can take a scientific article to your doctor and say, look, because <laughs> there's, there's probably 40 articles on there about vitamin D. So you could have that information. I've told people email me or call me and I can email it to you so it's not hard to get. Yes ma'am? If you happen to have multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and fibromyalgia, taking vitamin D, will that help you? She says, <coughs> I think that uh, she's kind of putting up a possibility here. If you have multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and fibromyalgia, I think we just heard her personal story. <laughs> Should I take vitamin D? Absolutely get your vitamin D level checked, and if it's low, fix it. And it may make an incredible difference in symptoms. Takes about three months. Would it make a difference? Would it be advisable with having all that to take a higher dose of 
Would it be advisable to take a higher dosage under a doctor's supervision? Yes, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. We, right now, <clears throat> we do not know if you can treat multiple sclerosis with high levels of vitamin D. But the study is being done. It's underway. I saw uh, in the literature the pilot where they took people uh, with multiple sclerosis and then increased their vitamin D levels up, the dosage, 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 and they went all the way up to 10,000 international units a day and they found that the highest anybody got was a level of 93. Okay? So it seemed to be safe. But we don't know whether it will actually treat that. If you have aches and pains, and those are caused by the vitamin D deficiency, then I would expect those to go away after about three months. Wow, isn't vitamin D important? Did you have any idea? My, <coughs> it's almost <coughs> important enough to turn me into an evangelist. <laughs> you <laughs> <Or are. laughs> You're right, I've been talking like an evangelist, and I hope that you have been convinced. Any other questions? Yes, yes ma'am. The website again? Yes, let me move on to the next. I think there's another slide here. Uh, my recommendation is screen all high-risk individuals, aggressively replace anybody less than 20. There's that 50,000 two or three times a week with a meal. A teaspoon of oil may be helpful to increase absorption. Recheck levels in one to two months. Uh, treat to greater than 30 and to shut off osteoporosis. If you've got bones that are thin, in order to shut off the parathormone, which is pulling calcium out of the bone, you have to get over 30 on your, uh, on your level. And then consider high, higher levels with, in special circumstances. Let's see. Uh, RDA will be raised someday soon. Uh, they're still, the, RDA, the FDA is trying to be very careful about that. You need 1,000, as I mentioned earlier. It's safe now. The, the upper daily limit is at 2,000. That will be raised, I'm sure. This particular article is uh, a group of scientists, vitamin D researchers, who wrote this article to, say, to answer the question, what is the safe level? How much should we do? And it's a recommendation to the FDA as to what they should do with their levels. And last but not least, you can see the aclmarticles.net. Look under lectures and vitamin D. Okay, question in the back. Uh, vitamin D, I don't know of any vitamin D made in the eye. There are effects of light in the brain that happen through the eye, but those effects do not happen with vitamin D. Sunlight may be beneficial to the eye. It helps increase serotonin in the brain and can help the melatonin rebound, but that's a different mechanism. Okay? Yes, ma'am. The for, vitamin D level, she says, is 40 to 60. Now, when I first got started on this, it was, they were charging us like 90 to 100, okay? And I had a doctor friend who, when he heard me talk about it, he went home and said, I'd like to have a vitamin D level. How much would you charge me for that? And they were trying to charge him like over $200 for his vitamin D level. Now, they're being done more now, and the price is coming down. So I'm thankful for that, but it's still an expensive test. Yes, ma'am. Are there things that you should avoid with the, the keep vitamin D from absorbing? If you were taking, what is this, a lie? Have you heard of a lie? A lie? A lie? No, it's to help you lose weight. You take it and it's a fat absorption blocker. That might keep you from absorbing it. Uh, so anything that interferes with fat absorption may, may get in the way. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are you worried about the carrageenan? You have nothing to worry about on that. Now, our lecture tonight is not about carrageenan, but carrageenan, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about it. Don't worry about it. Okay? I'd rather you have vitamin D. Okay? And there's no good science on the carrageenan. There are a few rat studies, but nothing that really fits. Yes. Are there any lifestyle issues or eating patterns that could deplete vitamin D? Sure, if you got obese, then the vitamin D would be spread out over more. So that would deplete the kind of overall level. I can't think of anything else. Oh, maybe if you had your gallbladder removed, you wouldn't have as much bile, and maybe you might not absorb it as well, but that shouldn't deplete it. So 
So that's, that's all I can think of. Yes, sir. Going to uh, a general practitioner, uh, a family doctor. He's asking about a general practitioner would, and family would, doctor. Would he be one I could just ask how much do you know about the importance of vitamin D or do I need to go uh, He to says, uh, who says, do I need to go to uh, somebody special to hear about vitamin D? Some of the cancer doctors are now ordering it, at least at uh, Florida Hospital South. I've seen that. Uh, my residents are ordering it a lot now because they're hearing about it. They've discovered it. They laughed at me at first, and then when they had board questions about vitamin D, they started paying attention. Yeah, so that, that helped. So at least our family doctors know about it. But if you've got trouble, you can always get on the Internet, you know, my website here, and get one of those articles and take it, and you can say, I'd like to have my 25-hydroxy vitamin D level checked. Yes, ma'am. Let, let's just take a couple more, and then we're going to uh, quit you know, here. When you get a script from your doctor, like we always get one uh, so that the next time we go, we have our blood work done. That long paperwork, is that vitamin D on there? If she, she, says, uh, she says when she goes to the doctor, the doctor gives them a lab slip. And uh, that uh, lab slip, they can have their blood done later before they come back next time. And is vitamin D on there? The vitamin D is only on there if your doctor ordered it. Well, I mean, so they, it, it can be checked on there. As long as it's checked on there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And if you can get away with it, I suppose you could check it yourself. <laughs> okay, last questions. <laughs> Where do you get vitamin D? I don't spend any, I don't really uh, spend, I don't know about and I don't spend any time worrying about the manufacturer. Uh, I, you know, you, I'll leave that up to you. You can research that up yourself. I got on the internet and found capsules with 5,000 international units, so I only have to take one. And they're not that big. Okay, they're really small. 5,000 sounds like a lot, right? And the 50,000 sounds terrible, but it's a little green thing that's really easy to swallow. So don't let the numbers throw you off, except the 5, they're important. The 5,000 still, still have to be a prescription. The 5,000 are not a prescription. They're over the counter. I, I, let, me, let me, well, there's more hands going up, but I mean, it's been an hour and a half, and it's kind of time to wrap up. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards for any of you who are interested. I, I do want to thank you again for coming out, and uh, <clears throat> I know that this is kind of a church environment, and we need to, in a church environment, we are thinking about sharing the good news about what Jesus has done for us, and that is indeed good news. At the same time, <clears throat> uh, there may be some health things that are benefit. Did you notice that when you take something bad like cholesterol, and shine the sun on it, it turns it into something good, like vitamin D, there has got to be a theological lesson there somewhere. So spread the good news.